And with that, I am very pleased to start the keynote portion of our uh, event. I'd like to, I'm proud to introduce Chris Kersey from Kersey Fabrications. Chris um, is coming to us from Atlanta. This is a presentation um, on amazing technology that he's put together. And we actually uh, saw it at Dragon Con um, on Labor Day weekend in Atlanta and uh, thought this would be an amazing uh, bit of uh, storytelling and uh, crafting that would be shared. So Chris, you're welcome to join me on stage. We'll get started. And as, as he's coming up, everybody, please enjoy the rest of the day. Okay, so where do I start? Um, I think I'm going to start at the beginning, which is typically not where people want me to start on this because it's a relatively long story, but I'm going to move rather quickly. Um, the story here is when I was asked to do this, I was, I was, first of all, thank you all for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, but being invited to something related to Apache was, was pretty much a full circle invite for me. And I kind of wanted to tell that story about how the Apache Foundation, the Apache software in particular, the, the Apache server, influenced me and how that led to Iron Man, believe it or not. There we go. All right. Well, let's switch. I hope the helmet works better than the slideshow. All right. So, what if we could blur the line between science fiction and reality through the power of open source? And that's really the story about how I got to this. It is really a lifetime, at least for me, of open source software, the open source community, and what it's meant to me to bring a project like this to life. All of the pieces that go into this uh, that are open source, and the very reason that, as you're going to see here at the end, I open source this project as well. All right, so about me. Um, so I was a gamer kid, a uh, computer nerd that liked to take computers and everything else apart. And uh, all of these things led to me being a content creator. I have a YouTube channel, actually two YouTube channels now. Uh, one for uh, 3D printing and making, and then one that I've recently started dedicated to the Oasis project, which is gonna be me talking more about code and, and the deeper technological side of what I do, which doesn't really fit my primary channel. Uh, I'm a cosplayer. I've been cosplaying for over 15 years now, doing things like Dragon Con. Uh, the uh, software developer thing I've been doing since high school, turned it into a career. I've been pretty happy with that. Uh, the maker space, I will tell you in a little bit about how I got back into being a maker. Uh, and then, obviously, I have a life outside all of this. I've been a teacher and a coach. Uh, I'm a father and I'm a husband. Uh, and this is kind of in reverse order of importance. <laughs> And why should you care? So what I'm going to show you here is a bit of a teaser as to what I built. This is the helmet. That is the arc reactor that runs it all. And this is what it looks like. That's what it looks like when I'm in the helmet. It is stereo vision. It does have optical protection, at least when I enable that particular branch of code. And this is my YouTube channel where I show all this off. Um, Usually, like I said, I deal with 3D printing and all, but it led me into this. It led into this project was kind of the culmination of everything that I've been working on for probably the past 20 years of my life. So, where did I start and why does all of this matter and, and why does open source matter to this story? So, my very first introduction to computers um, started with my mother bringing home old computers from school that she was allowed to bring home during the summer. I can pretty much guarantee you that my mother was the most influential part of what, what I've become today. Uh, she provided the technology. She allowed me to, to interact with early computers 
in a way that I would not have gotten to otherwise. Uh, this led to a uh, love of Commodore 64s and Apple IIs, uh, which I learned basic on as early as somewhere in the... Let me, let me start by saying, every time I give you, every year or date or age, is my memory. There's no way that I'm right on all of these, so if I tell you something happened when I was 16, I might be lying. I'm doing my best to remember this and tell the story as best I remember it. So I, I got my first Commodore 64 when I was about 8 or 10 years old, somewhere in that time. I couldn't do much with it, but it came with a manual that taught me basic, and I thought the coolest thing in the world was to get it to print my name over and over and over again on the screen. The fact I could tell a machine to do something and it would be able to do that was just one of the coolest things in the world. And that was my first introduction. And that led to me having a love of basic programming all through middle school. Uh, and these wonderful books like this, which provided free source code, taught me source code through these just wonderful, like, I could copy something out of this book. I would have a game that worked for me, that I copied and pasted myself, but then I would be able to learn from this source code. This was the very first uh, open source. I'm going to use the term open source loosely. I know some of this is commercial or, or whatever, but it's open source in the sense that it's available. It's something that you can learn from. And so next was the, you know, fast forwarding through learning DOS, Windows 3.1, uh, having to create a boot disk for every game that I wanted to be able to play, and rearrange the memory. So this was, again, all a good, uh, good source of learning that unfortunately kids today don't get to do. So moving on uh, into high school, this is where my, my Linux journey began. Uh, it is uh, the World Wide Web, as we used to call it. Uh, it started to exist, and it was absolutely wonderful. I was an AOL user, a Prodigy user, a CompuServe user, and I remember when uh, the first beta web browser came to AOL, and it was an absolute eye-opening experience. I wondered what we were going to do with all this technology and how I could learn how it works. That's what led me into this new OS called Linux. Uh, and as most people in this room may remember, you didn't download it back then most of the time unless you were on a university campus. But we had this wonderful, magical place called Walden Books and all of them all, which had a huge Linux section of all these box distributions. And that's how I got my start uh, to begin with on Linux. So buying copies of Susie, Red Hat, uh, and then learning how to build all of these things myself uh, over my 56 k So we, we, we downloaded Thine, we downloaded Sentinel, we downloaded Apache, and we were able to have our own corner of the internet sitting on the floor of my bedroom. And that was, like I said, this was an amazing thing that people were opening this up, that you could learn with what was available in the open source community. So, as I moved into college, I had, I'd learned all of this uh, wonderful things. Uh, and by the way, uh, we didn't have cell phones, so I didn't have a picture of me in my bedroom, so AI helped me generate a picture of my bedroom. That's very close approximation to what my bedroom looked like in the 90s. Uh, but we had open source everything in college. We could pretty much do anything we want. Uh, at that point, I was living in different dorms, different housing. We had uh, good internet connection. It opened everything up for me. Uh, at that point, I wanted to do more with source. I was a big hardware geek. I always have been. I'm an embedded software developer now by trade. And so I really wanted to uh, do more about optimizing software for hardware. So I really got into the distributions like Slackware and Gentoo. And uh, so I was compiling literally everything. I would leave my computer running overnight just compiling the distribution. Um, and then, so the college had a few notable contributions to the open source community. Uh, I, I had a couple of Linux drivers I patched that uh, were probably lost to time at this point. There was nothing major there, but for a kid to be able to contribute to the Linux kernel was pretty amazing. 
I thought it was a pretty big deal, even though it may have only been 10 lines of code. It was very cool to be able to contribute to something like Linux. Um, and then, uh, probably one of the biggest contributions I made during that time period was I was part of a reporting team that ported Gentoo Linux to x86-64, as we called it back then. I don't know, do we still call it that? I don't know. But anyway, it was Gentoo Linux, x86-64, and uh, I got my hands in so much code because so many people didn't know you couldn't cast ints to everything. And so the number of different software that we had to change uh, just because of casting errors between pointers and different uh, formats. Uh, and so I ended up committing a, a lot of code uh, that hopefully a lot of people had to take in upstream. Uh, and then uh, the, the only open source project I created myself during that time period was an a application called X Sensors, which was just a very simple GTK application uh, that uh, just showed your, your sensors that were available on your hardware. Uh, and funny story on this one is, this is something I left behind long ago. I know a lot of distributions had incorporated it, uh, but I, I kind of abandoned it. It was, it was a simple GTK app. But I was very happy uh, to find out when I searched for it the other day that it still exists. Someone branched it. There's a GitHub uh, for it these days. Uh, it is still available in a lot of distributions, so I was real happy to say that. I don't know if my name is still anywhere on it, but uh, it still exists, and I saw the, the, the proof on the website. <laughs> So, next up, I wanted to really get back. I still uh, have a lot I wanted to share. I wanted to find my own niche in the community, and I created a website called linuxhardware.org. Linuxhardware.org uh, really just showed my passion for hardware. Uh, it allowed me to share with the community, how do you get hardware working? How, how can I get Linux running on my laptop? How can I get my video card that doesn't want to work working? So, I put up a lot of articles there. Uh, I, at one point in time, there was a database I created. I don't know whatever happened to that. Uh, and so that peaked um, around 2004 to 2006, right before I had my first kid. Um, and around that time, I determined I didn't have time for websites anymore. And uh, this is where the law happens in life. And I work, and I get better, and I So, what did open source provide to me? Uh, it it honed my skills in programming, problem solving, uh, and let's be honest, we were the first remote workers, right? Because that was the way we worked as teams. It was a global network of developers that contributed to Linux, contributed to all of these projects, uh, and and so we learned how to remote work early. We know uh, we you know the communities invented all of these source repos. They invented SDN and CBS and Git so that we could all work together. Uh, the, uh, it deepened my passion for technology and innovation because by having all of these different packages available, for having all of this software available, you could learn skills, you could learn technology that were not in your will house, that were not part of your day job, and it expanded your horizons. And the, you know, it, it grew me up, grew me up. It brought me up in a community of people that wanted to share their passions, that wanted to work together, that wanted to not just do this for profit, but also wanted to do it for fun. So, I, like I said, brought up a family, had three kids and disappeared a bit from the, the community for a while uh, until my passion was rekindled around 2017. And around that time, the 3D printing revolution had taken over. We started having kit printers available to us. And this, to me, was the piece that I had been missing. I could not only build things with hardware uh, that had function, but I could also give them form. And again, as I, as I sp spoke about my mother's influence, my mother was a mechanical design and CAD teacher, so I had learned CAD early on in life, and all of a sudden I could put that to use as well. And so I picked up uh, Fusion 360 and learned, relearned CAD again 
as well as how you do 3D CAD with Power Blender Blender 4. Uh, and to my great surprise, and it was great to see another community of people working together open source software, open source hardware, free 3D models. It was another community of people that were giving back uh, for the process. So, years before that, stepping back a little bit, there was a little movie called Iron Man. It came out in 2008. Uh, it, I, I think it is still one of possibly the number one things that took geek mainstream and made it cool to be in the comic books. Um, but one thing I, I always took away from that movie was the realistic portrayal of the engineering process. Yes, a lot of the stuff he was inventing and a lot of technology that was involved in that movie are things that are unrealistic, things you can't do. Uh, we don't have arc reactors. You can't survive a missile hit even if you're in the suit. But we learned from that. Kind of, you know, it showed the engineering process. He failed during that process. It went very quickly, but you saw him hitting walls. You saw him making mistakes. Um, and even though some of the stuff was kind of rude they did in the movie, you saw someone making iterations to a, a build. He went through a Mark I, a Mark II, a Mark III. You saw how he was iterating on the process. Right? I was fascinated that they cared enough in those movies to show the engineering process realistically. And then all of this tech, again, just a minute ago when I was talking about uh, 3D printers, all of this tech began to be real and began to be accessible. 3D printers were becoming accessible, so you could print these things. Uh, miniaturization became better and better, meaning we had higher end tech, uh, such as the, the cameras, the displays. Uh, we finally had VR headsets and AR headsets. Uh, we had machine learning algorithms that came uh, and, and led to the AI revolution that was aided in. So, I wanted a really cool project to work on. I wanted not only to print doodads and toys and things with my 3D printers, I not only wanted to, to build little cool tech gadgets, but I wanted a big project. I wanted something that really would take my skills and put them to good use. And this idea of building Iron Man, building uh, particularly the helmet part, which I think ties everything together, uh, was really something that I, I could pull all of my resources for. Uh, and not only that, but I could envision it. I knew how it worked in my head. I knew we had all of the pieces, but no one was taking the time to do it. The, the joke of, why do we have billionaires but no Iron Man? That kind of thing. And I'm like, well, I may not be a billionaire, but I believe we can build these things with stuff off the shelf. I want to try to do it. So in 2020, that journey again. So let's talk about the helmet itself. That's what a lot of you wanted to see. I wanted to demonstrate how it works. We're going to do a live demo here with it on the table, but let's go over how it works and what's in it. So this is all running on an NVIDIA Jetson or an NX. That's not where it started. It started on a NVIDIA Nano, which could not do any of it. And then I moved up quickly to what was called an Xavier NX, which had 8 gigs of memory. Uh, and now I'm up on the Orin NX, which has 16 gigs of memory. It also has an NVIDIA GPU with about more cores built into it. Uh, you really need this level of hardware. A lot of people ask, when do we get to run it on a Raspberry, Raspberry Pi? My answer is we probably don't. Because the amount of processing this does, uh, most of the Raspberry Pis can't even handle the video that passes through this, much less adding anything else to it. Uh, so I, I give NVIDIA hardware a lot of credit for having the horsepower to do this and the versatility to do this because uh, the beauty of the NVIDIA platform is it has shared memory between the uh, GPU and the CPU, so I can actually rebalance the code uh, based upon what do I have resources for? How's the CPU being used? How's the GPU being used? So it lets me rebalance everything. Uh, and since the GPU has uh, the, the CUDA cores, uh, I can 
decide to move things over to that, uh, that multiprocessor port. Uh, the tech integration. Uh, we've got dual display on here, dual cameras, uh, so we do have true stereo vision. I can walk around in this helmet for a good hour with no problems. I've done that at a con before. Uh, it's an, actually it's quite a fun experience. Uh, with the only real problem being peripheral vision because the displays in it are square, so you lose a little bit off the sides. Um, and really the challenge of this is balancing the high performance with the compact design and energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is still not a thing I would love to have an ARCA reactor to, to go for more than an hour. So. More on the tech because I know some of you care. The dual 1440 by 1440 screens gives me a total of 2880 by 1440 at 120 hertz. Yes, it will run at 120 frames per second. Um, but the cameras uh, are a limitation, and right now I'm doing those at 1080p at 60 hertz, trying to get the 60 frames per second out of the camera, and that's a 1080p that's cropped because again I have square display, so I have to crop the camera off a little bit. There's a microcontroller on the top of the helmet that does all of the uh, sensor processing for me, and then that's sent over to the, uh, to the helmet via a USB cable. Uh, it's a TVC 4.0, has a GPS module, a 9 degree of freedom, uh, freedom sensor, uh, humidity, and temperature sensors all in the helmet that I can keep track of what my um, what my health is, I can keep track of, am I getting too hot? Uh, I'm not usually oversensitive to that, so I have to keep an eye on it. So, bringing the helmet to life, what software did I need? Uh, so the software stack, it is Linux, it's running on the NVIDIA, right now it's running on the NVIDIA OS, which is an uh, Ubuntu variant, uh, and I do want to switch this over to a Linux from scratch for a, uh, uh, you know, a homegrown version of the OS, but this has been the easiest way to get going. Uh, it is all C and C++ based. The only Python running on this helmet is the things that make the LEDs breathe on the front, because that was the easiest way to do spy. Um, AI capabilities, uh, and I'll talk more about the individual packages here in a minute. Uh, the AI vision capabilities does have real-time object detection using the video inference library, uh, TensorRC, uh, that's a feature that I go in and out of. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the uh, enhanced vision through the stereo, uh, AI driven overlays, meaning that I can actually turn the overlays on the helmet on and off with voice commands. I can say disable this, enable this. It's an interactive HUD. Uh, and the voice commands. So one of the, the keys for me when I'm designing something like this. Like I said, I'm an embedded software engineer, so I think about how would you build one of these if you wanted it to be real. All of this was designed to not just be graphics, not just be toys. It's supposed to work like I think that Tony would have designed it in movies. And so it has a speech recognition system, but it is a command first speech recognition for the system where it detects all of my voice commands before it ever goes to AI. So if AI is not available, if the AI engine crashes, if I don't have access to the internet, whatever the case may be, those commands are recognized first. Uh, it's one of my, I think, one of my favorite pieces of code I wrote where I can take a JSON file that has a list of commands that are in JSON format and then it turns those into over 500 individual sentences that I might say in order to enable or disable or switch commands or something like that. So um, this, uh, that was really important to me, again, for safety, for functionality. If I ever wanted to try to do anything real with this helmet, it needs to, mon it needs to monitor for those commands first. Um, and, and so uh, JSON configuration files, again, text-to-speech, speech-to-text, all of that's in there. Uh, I have integrated it with an OpenAI API for advanced queries and responses from the cloud. Uh, but, uh, was it a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago at this point, I also have local AI running on device now. Uh, and you can dynamically switch back and forth between your cloud AI context and your local AI context. It keeps your context as if you never swap between them. 
Uh, and it can do that both dynamically, as in I lost connection, switching to local AI, and then I can just tell it by a command, enable local AI or, or enable cloud AI, and it will switch based upon my command. So, obviously, this is the full circle part where I've talked about how Apache and open source got me started. It led me through my entire career. And this project would not be possible without open source and all of these projects that are running on this helmet. I am not an engineer that knows how to do all of these things. And so without the open source community making these available, a project like this would not be available. Uh, everything from the simple direct media layer that does the 2D graphics, GStreamer, which is responsible for all the, the video that you're going to see on the screen. Uh, and then obviously, I am not an AI or an ML engineer by trade, even though I'm doing my best to learn the new technology. So things like Piper, Boss, from Onyx, and Holly. Um, the Llama CPT, which runs the local LLM on there. Uh, again, I'm using the term open loosely here, but Google, Llama, uh, you know, Meta providing these LLMs for free for us to use. Uh, it's a huge um, benefit to the community because now we have access uh, and don't have to rely on companies like OpenAI and the cloud to be able to implement and play with things. Uh, and then Bastido, which is responsible, the MQTT daemon, which is uh, responsible for all the communications on the continent. So, let's talk about the future of this project before I actually do a demo. Um, so the lessons learned, feedback uh, for the, this is V1, so V1 of the helmet. Fit, people want to see it fit better, people want to see it smaller, people don't want to see the cross-eyed Iron Man that, that we like to joke about because you've got to see these, uh, the types of cameras I used here. I went with high-end cameras because I wanted the experience to count most. Uh, and so I went with high-end cameras, they have lenses, you can't hide them. Uh, but the next version, I'm going to be high-end. Uh, so the improved uh, sensor accuracy, I've got new environmental sensors going into the next helmet. Uh, I've got uh, a new helmet model. We're going with a different mark suit for the next one. We're going to be trying to hide the cameras. Uh, I should have put a mark out on that better power usage because that's not happening anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> this helmet currently consumes 25 watts uh, while I'm using it. And so I wear a, a battery pack on my hip uh, for the power source for this. Um, uh, and then I'm going to do a little health monitoring. So in the movies, he is able to ask Friday, how am I doing? What's my blood pressure? Things like that. I'm going to do my best to add some of that. Uh, yeah, I'm already down the road there a little bit. So there's going to be real-time health monitoring. Um, and virtual two stretch goals, uh, interactive UI with eye and hand tracking. I am going to be doing my best to add uh, some of that. It's one of the reasons I disabled the uh, ML overlays that you saw in that video clip was because it's kind of everywhere without eye tracking. Uh, it's, it's not as useful, so I want to add, add eye tracking that pairs that ML with where you're looking on the screen. Uh, and then, and one of my stretch goals is already accomplished. Uh, I've enhanced the AI interactions and responsiveness. The local LLM is done, uh, and so that is all available on the helmet now. Uh, and community engagement, open source release with collaboration and innovation. Uh, a lot of people ask me, how can I do it? How can I get started on this? Um, and so, open source sharing the journey. Um, again, I'm going to be inviting everyone to join me on this project. If you wondered what OASIS stands for, it stands for Open Armor Systems Integrated Suite. Thanks to AI for helping me with a bunch of acronyms. <laughs> so uh, that's where we came up with the OASIS. Uh, you'll see that there are a bunch of things. The, the uh, heads up display is called Mirage, that has an acronym. Uh, the, uh, the AI assistant is called Dawn, uh, named after my wife, but that is also an uh, acronym as well. And um, 
So the idea is, of course, is how are the communities to innovate and expand this platform? Uh, I want to identify practical uses for this technology. Uh, there are a lot of wonderful practical uses that I have already come up with in my head that some people have emailed me about. Uh, everything from using this in the field, uh, particularly for first responders, uh, to people that have uh, vision or hearing difficulty and could potentially wear something, obviously nothing this bulky or, or sci-fi, but something that could help people with, with different types of disabilities, and I definitely want to expand that. Uh, capability. Uh, and again, as I was saying, this is a modular system. All of these work by themselves. If you only want the HUD, you don't have to run the AI. They will detect each other and then react to each other being there. They communicate, uh, they communicate over MQTT, as I said, and so there's an interaction that they can either ignore or communicate and participate with. And so Raj, Don, uh, Aura, which is the, head, the, the helmet uh, software, uh, all of these, again, they're interactive, but exclusive if that's the only piece you need. Uh, in fact, one of the next things I want to do is take Dawn and make it a home assistant. So this is one of the things I did last night. I released the source and I told no one. So last night, I, you know, when you have a piece of source code, you don't know when you're going to be ready. When's the source ready? When do you want to share it with everyone? And I took this opportunity, coming to this conference, giving this keynote, and I'm like, now's as good a time as ever. I'm happy with where the, the software is. And so if you go to this GitHub uh, organization, you will find all of the source for this project. So if you want to go check it out, again, it's all C++. Uh, it requires a large stack of dependencies to build. Uh, and right now it does only run on NVIDIA hardware. Uh, but maybe one of you will change that. Here's where you can find me, and then we'll get to the demo. I'll just leave this up here. Um, so th these are my two channels. I put QR codes to make it easy on everyone. Uh, Curzy Fabrications, I'm up over 40,000 subscribers. I've been running that channel, I guess, for about six years now uh, in the Oasis project, uh, which still needs subscribers because I'm at like 300 on that one. Uh, but it's where I'm posting a lot of the latest information about this project, trying to build that up. So if you're aware of the YouTube algorithm, it doesn't care. So there we go. Let's switch over and let's do a quick demo of what it looks like in real time. I'm gonna to have to plug and unplug to make it happy. Yeah, try it again. Let's give it a shot. There we go. All right, so last week I coded the ability for it to work on any size display, and I'm really happy that's working. <laughs> like I said, the, the, the original version of this was 2880 by 1440. The whole canvas is built for that. But thanks to a few SDL commands I learned again, thanks to my OpenAI coding assistant, uh, we figured out we could keep all these uh, things the same and, and work through it. So I'll do a little pickup to show you that all the HUD elements are real. It does the tilt, it does the pan, uh, it does the direction at the top of the screen. It does have a real clock on it, uh, which is probably still set to Eastern time. Uh, and you're not getting GPS with a hotel above us, but the, uh, the GPS does work in it as well. As you can see, there's a bunch of sensors here. I'm gonna have to go to see what it's reading. Uh, so as you can see, there is the temperature, the humidity inside the helmet, uh, the CPU, memory usage. Uh, memory usage, as I was saying, I, one of the hardest things I, I've had to do with this technology is getting all of these pieces to work in the amount of RAM that I have. So this is 16 gigs of memory running text-to-speech, speech-to-text, an AI assistant, uh, the, the framework for the AI assistant, as well as a mobile LLM. All that 60 gigs of memory, and it looks like about 96% memory. Uh, 
Um, uh, the fan speed that you change in the kernel location for where the fan speed is, so that doesn't work anymore. Uh, and you can see you got a Wi-Fi signal uh, as well. Uh, and one of my coolest new features was when you're talking to an AI assistant rather than typing to an AI assistant, there was no visual indicator or any indicator whatsoever that she knew what, I, that I had any idea what she was doing. I didn't know if she heard me. I didn't know if she was processing my request. I didn't know what was going on. So you'll see up in the upper right hand corner there of the display uh, a little Friday indicator, uh, which tells you the name of your AI, which is something that you can set. You can call him or her or it, whatever you want to, and that would be reflected in your HUD real time. Uh, and then there's a little LED that I have there that processes, uh, it shows me what state it's in. So as of right now, this should be running off the hotspot on my phone, so I'm not 100% sure at what speed I will be getting these OpenAI responses, because right now it's on the, the cloud side of things. But we're going to switch over uh, to the microphone for the helmet, and we're going to see how it works. Again, I have no earthly idea what she's going to say to any of my questions, because again, this is a live AI demo and you don't know what you'll get. So we're going to give it a shot. As you can see right now, I'm talking to it. It detects that I'm speaking and so it goes into this purple mode. But I can go, okay, Friday, I'm at the keynote speech. Will you say hello to everyone? Maybe I was talking too much. Let's try again. Okay, Friday, I'm at the keynote speech. Will you say hello to everyone? Of course, sir. Just say a word to me, right? And I'll fight for the rest of your audience. <laughs> okay, Friday, let's go ahead and do that right now. So a little bit on the command processing. Again, I'll, I'll get it to go to green. Okay, Friday, disable map. Disable map display. Okay, Friday, disable armor. Disable armor display. Okay, Friday, enable logging. So as you see, totally interactive command processing first. Even though it sounds like Friday, there was no AI interaction there. That was purely uh, the command processing engine that I wrote to, to do the command processing first. Um, let's, let's try switching over to the local AI. Okay, Friday, enable local AI. Okay, Friday, let's do some math. What is the integral of x squared? The integral of x squared is 1 slash 3x plus c, sir. There you go. So, uh, one of the reasons I switched over to using Gemma, so I used a lot of different local AIs. I've even tried the new Llama uh, 1D and 3B that are available. And one of the things was, is I switched over to Gemma because it is particularly well suited to answering functional questions. Uh, it doesn't, it's not a great conversationalist, but when I'm in the helmet and I have a question, I'd rather have an accurate answer than necessarily being able to, um, you know, have a conversation while I'm walking around the time. So uh, I'm really, I've really been happy with Gemma. Uh, it's, it's been a great AI assistant. And again, uh, let me see if it can do this because, again, I'm, I'm, this is a live demo and I've, it should have been, uh, even though I was talking to OpenAI at one point, that context should have been shared across both of them. Uh, let's see if it can answer a question.
Okay, Friday, where am I speaking at? Again, you do this live, you don't know what it'll get. I told it earlier I was at Community Overcoat, but uh, he apparently didn't remember that far back. But anyway, that's it. Um, again, I encourage everyone, go check out the source code. It's all available for you now. Uh, I want to say thank you to everyone in this room that has contributed to the various projects that I and others have uh, been a part of all of these years for providing inspiration, for providing code to learn from, and providing a community to grow up in that allows me to build things like this and others to push technology forward. So to answer the question I posed earlier, open source absolutely is necessary to drive this level of innovation because none of us know all of this technology by ourselves and by sharing what we know with each other, we can build cool things like this. because I, I often think about, like, I've got kids, and none of my kids are interested in this, believe it or not. So I've got, I've got three kids. Uh, I've got artists, and I have gamers, but I do not have tech enthusiasts that care anything about what Dad does in the garage. And, you know, I, I often lament the fact that they grew up in, with uh, computers that are too easy to use. Uh, and and I, think, I think you're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. They didn't grow up with an Apple II that didn't do much. They didn't grow up with a, a DOS 6.22 command prompt that they had to learn how to use in order to run their games. Um, and so I often think, how do we get this new generation engaged? And I would actually really like to see more um, taking kids back and teaching them the roots of where we came from. Um, and so I think that if you were to put more technology classes and teach them basic, and teach them, um, teach them DOS, and the reason I say this, obviously, it doesn't have a practical application to a lot of things that we do today. They're not gonna take it in code games and basic, but they might because it's fun, right? And so I think it's important that we continue to share the history of what we've come from and how difficult it used to be and why all of these underlying things that people ignore are so important. Um, and so I wish that, we see it a lot in, in a lot of the core curriculum that you see in schools today, right? There's a lot they're doing in math now that I don't understand because we weren't taught it, but I understand the application. I understand why they're being taught some of these more basic mathematical skills and mathematical frameworks. And maybe we should do the same with technology. Maybe we should be teaching them how it builds on each other and not just teaching them how to use it. Yeah. 